first of all, I'd like to thank the organizing committee for the opportunity to join you here in Serbia, even though I can't be with you in person. For today's lecture, we've prepared a few interactive activities. Uh, now, hopefully you have received a QR code in your packet uh, and you can use that QR code to uh, join the class community and begin the very first activity. So, uh, activity number one, following your QR code, please uh, begin the activity and I look forward to finding out a little bit about you. I'd like to begin today with the idea that teachers are somewhat peculiar. And by that I mean atypical of the students who we are engaging with in learning environments. We have a unique role in the classroom. We are subject experts, content guides, and mentors in the knowledge building process. This role sets us apart from our students who tend to be younger or less experienced in our field, but this isn't the only difference. We also tend to be the people who have benefited most from effective educations, and this makes us somewhat atypical of the students we teach. The final difference between us is that we are quite strongly outnumbered in a standard classroom environment. It turns out that we will do our students something of a disservice if we do not take into account the wide variety of human experiences who are joining us in the room while we are learning together. One way we can think about the differences between ourselves and our students is to think about what it was like when we were students. So if you're a teacher now or if you're thinking about uh, being an educator, you're probably one of the students who maybe among your class cohort, maybe you put in a little bit more effort than some of those around you. And maybe you came into the classroom with a better knowledge base or developed more skills along the way, which puts you up here at the very tails of a distribution of typically distributed students. And what this means when you come to the task of educating others is that those students who are most like you are also the ones up here in the tails of the distribution. If it's possible for us to shift the focus of our teaching down to students who are less like us, then we have a better chance of having a successful learning journey for the majority of students who are with us. So what I'll be talking about today is five tips for how we can realign our teaching strategies to catch more of those students who are a little bit less like us. First of all, I'd like us to think about this idea of teaching for the typical student. If we're up here in the tails of the distribution of students, we might want to try to shift our focus somehow to students who are gathered together in the middle of this class distribution rather than just teaching for the students who are like us. Uh, and one approach that we can take when we're trying to do this task is to look to cognitive psychology and lessons from the science of memory for how we can enhance the strength of a memory representation for a typical student. So when we look to the field of cognitive psychology, one of the things we learn is every time we access a memory, we make that memory itself labile. We make it plastic. We give it an opportunity for change. When we look to the science of learning, there are some concrete tips that can help us help our students to consolidate those memories effectively. The first of these strategies is called retrieval practice, where a student might have to try to bring to mind information that they have already represented earlier on. The second strategy is called spaced practice, and studies in the past have shown that students who, who use spaced practice and rehearse the skills that they're going to need later on at regular intervals spread out over days or weeks or months recall that information much more clearly than if they squeeze together all of their practice time into one consolidated chunk. The third strategy we have here is called interleaving and this is the idea that if we break apart our different blocks or sessions of practice with rehearsal of different kinds, our memory structures become more effective and more robust and more resi resilient. 
The next three tips from the learning scientists have to do with the structure of information that we present and strategies for making information more sticky. All three strategies focus on a way of connecting abstract information to other kinds of knowledge that helps to enrich the representation that we form. So the first of these tips is known as elaboration, the second is known as concrete examples, and the third is dual coding. Here is an example from my class An Ape's Guide to Human Language where I incorporate cartoons into the curriculum materials alongside readings and other more traditional formats. Um, what we can see in this example is uh, the combination of text and images together to provide a richer, more elaborated knowledge structure for students to hook their memories onto. We can see Social learning elaborated into three concepts, the instinct to vocalize, vocal imitation, and uh, cultural transmission with adaptation. So we can see Alex the parrot as an example of instinct to vocalize, uh, an Australian lyrebird as an example of vocal imitation. These birds are known for their ability to uh, mimic the sounds of machines as well as other birds in the forest. And we can see cultural transmission with adaptation. And the example provided here is a baby bat who is mimicking, to some degree, the vocalizations of an adult bat. And by providing concrete examples and elaborating each of these points uh, to form a richer knowledge structure, uh, as well as providing the information through more than one channel, not just text, but also through images, we provide more chances for students to build richly elaborated representations of the information, and that can help to make that information more sticky during learning. Now, it's important to note here that I'm not talking about um, learning styles. I'm not talking about some students considering themselves to be more visual than others. It's been shown time and time again that in controlled tests of learning environments, all students do better if they're able to access information in more than one way or to encounter information presented with more concrete examples and more elaboration as well as uh, across these different modalities like incorporating text and images. So these six strategies for effective learning have all been demonstrated in the peer-reviewed literature to enhance learning outcomes for, for the typical student. These strategies are based on the way that memory is encoded and consolidated and the way that knowledge structures are built. And the point I'd like to make here is by bringing the science of learning into our teaching practice, we can focus our teaching strategies on uh, tips that are effective for the majority of students, even though the majority of students may not be learning or engaging with their studies in quite the same way that we did when we were students. The second tip I'd like to share today is the idea that we can challenge normative practices that assume all of our students are alike if we value diversity in our teaching practice. I teach in Singapore where there is a highly diverse ethnic and linguistic context. Here's an example of an activity we use in class called the language fingerprint and they create for themselves a language fingerprint which they share with the class along with a few sentences that talk about their language history. Now these language histories are really valuable for helping our class get to know each other a little and helping us understand the range of human experiences we have in the classroom together. To learn a little bit more about you and the diversity of experiences we have with us today, I've prepared activity number two. Now in this activity, I would like you all to imagine a red star. If you have the QR code with you, you can follow the link and uh, complete your answer to tell us which of the different options available best reflect your experience of imagining a red star. I'm super excited to see how you answer the questions. But to begin with, I'll share with you how some of my students have answered in the past. 
at one end of the scale, we can describe this as aphantasia, no mental imagery at all. At the other end of the spectrum, we can describe this as hyperphantasia, or a kind of extremely rich visual imagery. And when I've conducted this uh, test in my classes before, these are the number of people who give the different responses. So we can see we have two separate bundles of students. One bundle of students are imagining red stars with a little bit more or less detail, and one bundle of students are imagining nothing at all, or at least nothing visual. Now, I love this uh, example because people with aphantasia often have no idea that there are others in the class who have an actual, literal, visual representation of the star that they are imagining. And people with typical visual imagery often have no idea that there are other people who might have no visual representation whatsoever. So this little example allows us to discover something about the range of human variation in our class and respectfully engage with these differences. Now you might be wondering what this has to do with teaching. What's interesting is that for most of us, we have enhanced memory for concrete images over just encountering information in text form. And we have weaker memory if we're trying to learn relationships between abstract information that cannot be visually represented. What we don't know about is how memory can be structured for people who do not have the visual representation. And we also don't know very much about these people who have this hyperphantasia, this overly or extremely rich visual imagery. There may be benefits or deficits to either or both of these forms of mental imagery that we just don't know much about because the previous literature has focused on the typical student only. Another example of sensory differences is how we connect information across the senses. So I have on the screen two characters uh, and I'm going to uh, introduce you to two different names. Now, each of you can make your own decision on which name you think goes best with which character. So the names are Vono, Shiki. So if you'd like to add your response, uh, it's activity number three on the QR code. Now in the past, when we've done studies of this kind, we get agreements rates of around 89%. That is almost 90% of people make the same choice about which name goes best with which character. But there are a small proportion of people who don't make those decisions. For some people, it seems as though the senses are in some way more discrete from one another, that they're not connected up in ways that other people agree with. At the other end of the spectrum, we have a condition known as synesthesia, where the senses are connected very strongly, but perhaps in ways that are atypical compared to the rest of us. I'll give one example of synesthesia now. The most common variety of synesthesia is known as uh, letter color synesthesia or digit color synesthesia. So for synesthetes with this kind of synesthesia, every written number or every written letter is so powerfully connected to a particular color that when they see those digits, they also experience color, even if the text is in black and white. People with digit color synesthesia have a memory advantage for random strings of numbers. For non-synesthetes, on the other hand, remembering random strings of digits is much harder because there's no secondary source of information to hook the knowledge onto. A second example of how synesthesia might impact other kinds of learning processes has to do with sensory conflict. 
If that visually present colour is congruent with the colours of their synesthesia, then they get a boost. They get an advantage for being able to process memory or being able to process numbers in the expected way. But if that colour mismatches or misaligns with the intended target number, then they suffer a huge degree of conflict and that can disrupt normal processing. Now, for a non-synesthete, they neither get the advantage nor the disruption. So this is another source of individual differences that uh, may make any one learning environment quite diverse. One final source of difference that I'd like to share today uh, is my first experience of teaching at the higher education level with a deaf student. Uh, before our class started, she shared with me the accommodations that she would need to be a successful learner. And one of those accommodations was that all of our lecture content must be subtitled to help her gain the benefits of those materials. So by pro providing the subtitles for my one deaf student, I also provided supplementary text for my non-deaf students. So by reaching out for asking for and meeting the needs of more diverse learners, I ended up making the learning environment better even for the typical learner. So, when we think about not just moving the focus of our teaching to the students at the center, the typical student, but also reaching out and trying to find out about the patterns of diversity we have among our student population and trying to meet the needs of uh, learners with uh, specific accommodations, we actually enhance the potential for learning across an even wider range of our students and potentially bring even more of our typical students along with us. So this is just to say that diversity in our teaching practice can actually enhance options for everybody. Tip number three is about lowering barriers to participation in the classroom. If we think about who in an average classroom participates, there are a couple of things that may contribute. And we might think that those students who are the best prepared are the most likely to engage in our class materials. And because of their high level of preparation, they may also be more confident to contribute to class discussions. So we can see up the top here, a distribution of students where the students colored in green have done an average amount of preparation and the students in blue and purple have done a little bit more than that. This is the top 16% of students. And if these are the students who are also the most confident, this is what it would look like in that class of 50. We would have eight out of our 50 students uh, enthusiastically participating in class. But what if it turns out that the level of preparation is not actually related to the level of confidence that students have in class. What that means is that um, those students who are the best prepared might vary radically in how confident they are to join in a class discussion simply through personality factors or simply through other things that are going on in their life that mean that they have less certainty in the classroom environment. And if only those who have above average confidence as well as above average preparation are the ones who contribute to our class discussions, then this reduces the total participation rate to just 2%. And this is what that looks like in a class of 50. So if there's any possible way that we can lower barriers to participation, then we might be able to teach more of our students and bring more of them along with what's going on in the class environment. So the idea is we can try to lower the stakes for what it might mean to participate if your knowledge is incomplete or your preparation is a little bit less than you would like. And we can try to lower the stress 
of joining in for students who are less confident in providing or volunteering their answers. Now, if we can do that effectively, then we might be able to get more than half of our students participating if we lower the stakes and we lower the stress of the environment. So how are we going to achieve this? When we think about lowering the stress, the first thing that we can do is ask questions that students already know the answer to. Uh, it's a very peculiar thing that we do sometimes in classes where we ask questions where the instructor knows the answer and the student does not. Uh, and this puts students in a very stressful situation because they know that they will be evaluated on the basis of whether or not their knowledge matches the teacher's, even though the teacher is atypical. So we can help students to understand that we're interested in their internal worlds by asking them questions that the students know the answer to and we don't to show our engagement in their mental processes. Uh, a concrete example of this, uh, asking our students about their language backgrounds. We've also done the imaginary red star task, which was entirely based on your own individual and personal experience of imagining a red star. We can also ask task relevant questions like what was your favorite activity from last week's class? These can help to reactivate those memories once again to consolidate the memory structures but also help our students feel more confident being part of the classroom activity space. Now it's very important when we do these kinds of tasks that these are no stakes participation. So these might be quizzes where it's expected that you must hand them in, but they are worth no points. They're not graded or um, answering questions anonymously so that students don't have to be identified to one another if they don't know the answers in class. So we can reduce the stakes uh, of providing an answer by asking, first of all, questions that students don't know or anonymizing um, their answering channels so that they don't have to feel embarrassed in, about, in front of each other if they don't know the answers. The second tip that I like to suggest is encouraging speculations and guesses. So students often come to the class with the idea that their knowledge is constantly being evaluated and the best way to not be evaluated is to not take part. An alternative model is to concretely guide students to understand that partial or incomplete knowledge is okay at certain stages in the class, especially when students are building up their skills and knowledge. So an activity that I use for this is uh, something called a structure function task, where we provide students with two examples and ask them first to spot the differences. Those differences are superficial and evident at a surface review. But once they have looked for differences, they can begin to speculate about what outcomes those differences might have. And because this activity is explicitly framed as a speculation, we can review the answers from many, many groups uh, quite quickly without any pressure to have the correct right answer at the end. So another strategy that's aligned with this in terms of lowering the stakes is for activities like this, we might be able to use a low stakes assessment model, like one point for submitting a fair try, regardless of whether the answer is correct, because this gives us a discussion space for consolidating and refining those mental representations. A third suggestion, uh, is building anonymous peer sharing into activities. So I have a couple of examples here. The first is using uh, some kind of uh, sharing space, whether that's a physical pin board on a wall or a digital pin board like the ones you've seen today, uh, where students can present their work in front of one another without revealing whose work is whose. Now this is a very powerful tool because it allows students to see the range of student responses and self-evaluate how their own work fits into that model. Uh, this kind of activity doesn't necessarily need to be graded for students to get the benefit of seeing their own work relative to others. 
A similar strategy uh, is in the pass the paper quiz. Uh, which is an activity I like to do in face-to-face -face learning environments where we take a piece of paper and ask a short set of quiz questions. But at the end of each question, the person who is filling out the quiz folds over their quiz paper and hands it to the next person who answers one question, folds it over and then hands it to the next person who answers one question and so on. When we get to the end of the quiz, we shuffle the papers a few more times so that they're thoroughly mixed up and then each person opens a random quiz uh, and we get to go through the answers as a class and students can read out the answers on the paper in front of them knowing that it's not their own answer so we've reduced the uh, stress of being evaluated <laughs> This kind of a peer sharing activity is a great opportunity to provide formative feedback that helps students know or understand more about the task that they're trying to do without providing qualitative or evaluative or summative feedback, which tells them uh, a score for how well they are doing at some stage. It's learning focused, not uh, grades focused. So the final tip that I have for both lowering the stress and lowering the stakes is to incorporate certain kinds of group work into the actual class session itself. Because if a student has a lower level of preparation or a student has a lower level of confidence, by having an opportunity to discuss with their peers, they can build up their knowledge structures and also share the stress of giving a potentially wrong answer as though it might not be entirely their fault. <laughs> this is a great way of helping our students feel that they are allowed and invited into the interaction space in a classroom. So to sum up, if it's possible for us to lower the stakes of participation in terms of how much prep you have to do before you're eligible or allowed or appropriately uh, participating in a classroom. And if it's possible to lower the stress of that engagement, we end up with a more dynamic interaction space that brings more of our students along for the learning process. My fourth strategy for de-centering the professor is figuring out how we can make more space for the students to have active engagement in the activities of the class uh, while we are together. What we can see in the green line across the top here is the regular flow of a lecture where there might be some minutes of lecturing with some minutes of interaction and at any moment in time one student can be speaking in front of the whole class and discussing with the lecturer. Now this might look like a pretty good lecture, a few minutes of talking, a few minutes of questions, however when we think about the sum total of brains in the room at the time, most of the students are engaged only in listening during that lecture session. So I'm gonna talk us through a couple of different options for making more space to engage with the variety of human experience in our room. When we ask a question, if we can ask our students to discuss with a partner before we uh, come to the answering stage, then we can already see that a larger number of students are actively engaged in the activity before we get to the answering. And you can see the ratio of instructor talk to student talk is starting to shift in this activity. When we move to small group activities, however, we can see an even more radical shift. If we can get our students to discuss in groups of four or five, uh, even if not all students end up joining a group or not all students end up engaging fully in the task, we can all of a sudden see that the ratio of instructor talking to student talking has radically differed. And by allowing students these opportunities to engage with one another, the parallel talking that goes on in the learning environment has the advantage of helping those students to activate their own memory and knowledge structures, consolidate those memories, and work towards forming better representations of information than simply by listening. 
And if all we're interested in is listening, we could all pre-record all of our lectures and we wouldn't need to get together in the classroom ever. <laughs> so if we want to honour the diversity of students in our classes and the fact that they are present with us in time, we can build activities that uh, benefit from their presence and their interaction. To give an example of this, I have some discussion questions that I use with my students where the questions are presented in a shared slide deck and each student group has their own note-taking space uh, and we allocate a random reporter every week. If you want to find out more about the random reporter strategy, there are some links at the end of the talk. Um, at the end of the discussion session, the random reporter will share back with the class some of the elements that their group discussed. And it's an opportunity for a little bit of formative feedback. There are no grades allocated here. One point for submission of a fair attempt. Uh, and some opportunities to highlight work that was done particularly well across all of the groups. In addition, there's an opportunity to follow up after the class with some general notes that all of the students in the class could benefit from. So when we give students activities like this, the ratio of instructor talk to student talk changes dramatically. And we go from a situation like this, where the instructor is speaking for most of the class and a few students, those with the highest confidence and the highest preparation, may volunteer their contributions to the class. When we have co-talk in parallel during class time, we actually expand the total amount of talk that occurs in the classroom. We distribute that talk among a larger number of students. And if we use strategies like a random reporter to decide who's going to speak each week, then across several weeks or across a whole semester, we massively diversify the voices that we all hear from in the class environment. And we might discover things about our students that we might not have another way of knowing. There might be students who are brilliantly prepared, who never talk unless we open up and make the space for them to join the class community without having to seek that attention for themselves. There might be students who feel isolated from the learning process who, when given a community of learners who are also struggling, realize that it's okay to have incomplete knowledge while they are learning and building up their skills. And that can put them on the pathway to more effective learning in the future. The final tip I'd like to share for today is the idea of spending time meaningfully. If we're going to bring this diverse range of brains into a learning environment to work together uh, for some periods of time, it's important that we make use not only of the opportunity to teach, but for the students themselves to be doing work that is meaningly related to their learning. To spend time meaningfully, it has to be in the service of knowledge consolidation or skills development. So we've seen some examples of ways in which a class activity can be used to spend time meaningfully on core course content, building up skills, building up our uh, creative and rational thinking about problems in our areas, and learning about each other as a class in ways that are relevant to our class content. Another way of spending time meaningfully is working towards a concrete goal across the class uh, in a kind of project-based learning. So in an APES Guide to Human Language, uh, the whole class works towards the festival of the evolution of human language where each student presents a poster that features one particular primate uh, and they spend the entire semester applying the ideas and concepts learned in class to their target species. At the end of the semester, we hold the festival in a public space where students and non-students can come and browse the collection. And students can also build up their professional skills in science communication. We also spend the semester building up to this task with a series of weekly homework activities that we share in class anonymously so that students can see how 
they are developing their skills relative to others and identify opportunities for improvement. So what you can see across the top here are four weekly homework submissions about one particular primate and this particular primate, as they went through the course, was picking up skills and ideas from other students in the class that could help their final project be uh, better designed and more effective in science communication terms. And here's the outcome of that process. So this is an initial submission sharing a little bit about a gorilla and a final presentation sharing some insights into the way that gorillas are able to communicate and how that is similar to and different from humans. By the time we get to the end of this project work, our students are such experts that we can enjoy sharing our subject knowledge in fun ways as well. These kinds of activities aren't just limited to face-to-face -face interactions. Uh, over the past couple of years, we have adapted these strategies to digital interaction spaces, like the one you can see here in Gather Town. In each of these poster rooms, there are a couple of different activities. First of all, the long poster board that you can see is an interaction space where while the students are near each other, they can see each other's faces like a Zoom call, but they can also see this poster board where they can share and look at and browse each other's posters. The whole festival is documented in one giant festival website where we can browse the different primate science communication posters and learn about different species in a fun way. And the students, because they are working towards this concrete goal, this target of building something in the world for others to share, the time that they spend preparing for this has a different kind of resonance to it than just arbitrary test or uh, assignment items. So, if we want to bring along more of our students to enjoy the process of learning and get the most out of it, there are a number of concrete things that we can do to de-center the professor and their personal experiences from the teaching context. Uh, so rather than focusing only on those students who are like us, the ones who get us, who who seem most like us and, and behave in the classroom most like we used to. We can use lessons from the cognitive psychology of learning to understand more about how human memory is structured and how human memory can be strengthened to shift the focus of our classroom learning to where the majority of students are, where the students who are less like us can benefit more from our teaching. We can look for opportunities to bring in students whose learning or whose other uh, personal life experiences might be quite different from others and focus at least a little of our attention on making their experience relevant to others and also making sure that we're taking their needs into consideration in our teaching. And this also strengthens the learning experience for other students who are, are across the student spectrum. We can also lower the barriers to participation by lowering the stakes of participating, even if your knowledge is incomplete, and lowering the stress of participating by making it very clear uh, what we expect of our students in different activities. Uh, and not all participation activities are designed to evaluate students' knowledge, especially while they're learning. And if we do this effectively, we may even be able to make space for more student voices relative to the professor, professor's voice and spend that time meaningfully together. This way, we will make the most use of the diverse collection of minds we have together in the classroom and we'll de-center the experience of the professor in the learning environment. On that note, I'll mention that I've prepared some digital materials and references if you would like to follow up on any of these ideas afterwards. 
If you have the QR code with you, you can follow the link. I'm super excited to see how you answer the questions and I look forward for the opportunity for some discussion.